Chapter Eight of Memoirs of Madame Vigée Lebrun. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Memoirs of Madame Vigée Lebrun by Elizabeth Louise Vigée Lebrun. Translated by Lionel Strachey. Chapter Eight life in russia upon her majesty's return from Tsarkoyscello, count stroganoff came to me with her command to paint the two grand duchesses alexandrina and helen these princesses might have been thirteen or fourteen years old and their faces were angelic though of entirely different expression their complexions especially were so tender and delicate that one might have supposed they lived on ambrosia the eldest alexandrina was of the greek type of beauty and very much resembled alexander but the face of the younger helen was far more subtle i grouped them together holding and looking at the empress's portrait their dress was somewhat greek in style quite simple and modest as soon as i had done their pictures the empress ordered me to paint the grand duchess elizabeth not long married to alexander I have already said what a ravishing person this princess was. I should very much have liked not to represent such a heavenly figure in common dress, and I have always wanted to paint an historical picture of her and Alexander, so regular were the features of both. I painted her standing in full court dress, arranging some flowers near a basket full of others. When I had done her large portrait, she had another done for her mother in which i painted her leaning on a cushion with a diaphanous violet wrap i can say that the more sittings the grand duchess elizabeth gave me the kinder and more affectionate did she become one morning while she was posing i was seized with a giddy fit and grew so dazed that i had to close my eyes she took alarm and herself quickly ran for water bathed my eyes tended me with inexpressible kindness and sent to inquire after me as soon as i had got home about this time too i did a portrait of the grand duchess anne the wife of the grand duke constantine she born as princess of coburg without having a celestial face like her sister-in-law was nevertheless sweetly pretty she was probably sixteen and her features were all life and mirth not that this young princess ever knew much happiness in russia if it can be said that alexander inherited his good looks and his character from his mother it is equally true that this was not the case with constantine who strongly resembled his father without however being quite as ugly but like him endowed with a marvelously quick temper in that era the russian court usually included such a large number of beautiful women that a ball at the empress afforded an exquisite sight i was present at the most magnificent ball she ever gave the empress grandly arrayed sat at the end of the room attended by the first personages of the court close to her stood the grand duchess marie and paul alexander and constantine an open balustrade separated them from the space where the dancing was going forward the ball consisted of nothing but repetitions of the dance called polonaise in which i had for my first partner young prince bariatinsky with whom i went the round of the room and afterward took a seat on the bench to watch all the dancers i could not tell how many pretty women i saw pass before me but i cannot help saying that amidst all these beauties the princesses of the imperial family carried off the palm they were all habited in greek costumes with tunics attached at the shoulder with large diamond buckles i had taken a hand in the grand duchess elizabeth's dress so that her costume was the most correct paul's daughters however helen and alexandrina wore on their heads veils of light blue gauze strewn with silver which lent their faces an almost divine appearance the splendor of all that surrounded the empress the gorgeousness of the room the handsome people 
the profusion of diamonds and the sparkling of the thousand lights made a veritable enchantment of this ball a few days later i went to a gala dinner at court when i entered the room the invited ladies were all there standing by the table on which the first dish was already served a moment after a large door with two valves was thrown open and the empress appeared i have said that she was short but nevertheless on state occasions her erect head her eagle eye her countenance so used to command all was so symbolic of majesty that she seemed to be the queen of the world she wore the ribbons of three orders her garb was plain and dignified consisting of a muslin tunic embroidered with gold and enclasped by a diamond belt a pair of wide sleeves being turned back in oriental fashion over this tunic was a red velvet dolman with very short sleeves the cap set on her white hair was not adorned with bows but with diamonds of the greatest beauty when her majesty had taken her place all the ladies sat down to the table and according to universal custom laid their napkins on their knees while the empress fastened hers with two pins just as napkins are fastened on children she soon noticed that the ladies did not eat and suddenly burst out ladies you do not want to follow my example and you are only pretending to eat i have adopted the habit of pinning my napkin as otherwise i could not even eat an egg without spilling some of it on my collar i in fact observed her to dine with a very hearty appetite a good orchestra played during the whole meal the musicians being in a large gallery at the end of the room relating to dinners i may say here that certainly the saddest i ever went to at st petersburg was at a sister's of zuboff where i had neglected to present a letter of introduction six months of my sojourn in russia had gone by when i met her one evening coming out of the theatre she stepped over to me and said most politely that she was still waiting for a letter which had been given to me for her scarcely knowing what excuse to make i replied that i had mislaid the letter but that i would look for it again and hasten to bring it to her i accordingly went one morning to visit the Comtesse d and she invited me to dine with her the day after the next it was then the custom all over st petersburg to dine at half past two and i therefore went to the countess's at that hour with my daughter who was also invited we were conducted to a very melancholy drawing-room on the way to which i observed no preparations whatever for dinner one hour two hours went by but there was no more question of sitting down to table than if we had just taken our morning coffee at last two servants came in and opened several card tables and although it seemed rather strange to me that any one should eat in a drawing-room i flattered myself that dinner was now to be served but i was wrong the servants went out and in a few minutes a number of the guests had settled down to play cards about six o'clock my poor daughter and i were so starved that when we looked into a mirror we were frightened and sorry for ourselves i felt as if i should die not until half past seven were we informed that the meal was ready but our poor stomachs had gone through too much agony we were unable to eat anything at all i then found out that the Comtesse d dined at the hour usual in london the countess ought to have notified me but perhaps she imagined that the whole universe was aware of her dinner hour as a rule nothing was more distasteful to me than to dine in town but i was sometimes obliged to do it especially in russia where one runs a risk of mortally offending people if one declines their invitations too often i disliked the dinners the more as there were such a number of them they were highly luxurious most of the nobility had very good french cooks and the fare was incomparable a quarter of an hour before the guests sat down at table a servant would pass round a tray with all sorts of cordials 
and small slices of buttered bread. No cordials were taken after dinner, but always superior Malaga wine. It is the custom in Russia for the great ladies, even at their own houses, to go into table before the guests, so that the Princess Dolgoruki and others would take me by the arm in order that I might go in at the same time as they, for it would be impossible to exceed the Russian ladies in the urbanities of good society. I will even go so far as to say that they were without the haughtiness chargeable to some of our French ladies. At St. Petersburg, the rigor of the climate would be unnoticed by anyone who remains indoors. To such a degree have the Russians perfected the means of keeping their houses warm. From the very porter's door all is heated by such excellent stoves that the fires maintained in the chimney places are purely ornamental. The stairways and corridors are of the same temperature as the rooms whose communicating doors are left open without any inconvenience resulting. When the Emperor Paul, then Grand Duke only, came to France for the first time, he said to the Parisians, In St. Petersburg you see the cold, but here you feel it. And when, after spending seven and a half years in Russia, I went back to Paris, where the Princess Dolgoruki was also staying, I remember that on a certain day on which I had gone to see her, we were both so cold in front of her fireplace that we said, we must go to spend the winter in Russia to get warm. For going out, such precautions are taken that even foreigners are hardly affected by the severity of the weather. Everyone wears velvet, fur-lined boots in his carriage, and cloaks likewise heavily lined with fur. At seventeen degrees below zero the theatres are closed, and every one remains at home. I am perhaps the only person who, not suspecting how cold it was, ever took it into my head to pay a visit when the thermometer was at eighteen. The Comtesse Golovin lived rather far away, in the broad street called the Prospect, and from my house to hers I met not a single carriage which surprised me considerably. I nevertheless went on. The cold was such that at first I thought my carriage windows must be open. Upon seeing me enter her drawing-room, the Comtesse exclaimed, Heavens! How could you go out this evening? Do you not know that it is nearly twenty degrees? This made me think of my poor coachman, and without taking off my pelisse, I at once returned to my carriage and was driven home as quickly as possible. But the cold had so attacked my head that I was benumbed. My head was treated with cologne water to restore the circulation, otherwise I should have gone mad. One very astonishing thing is the small effect which this severe temperature has on the common people. Far from their health suffering in consequence, it has been observed that there are more centenarians in Russia than anywhere else. In St. Petersburg, as in Moscow, the great lords and all the notables of the empire drive six or eight in hand. Their postilions are little boys of eight or ten who ride with amazing dexterity. There are from two to eight horses, and it is curious how these little fellows, so lightly clad with their shirts sometimes open on their chests, cheerfully expose themselves to cold, which certainly would kill a French or Prussian grenadier in a few hours. As for me, who was content with two horses for my carriage, I was surprised at the submissiveness and resignation of the coachmen. They never complained. In the most rigorous weather, when waiting for their masters, either at the theater or a ball, they sit still without budging, and only knock their feet against the box to get a little warmth while the little postilions lie down at the bottom of the staircases. I must acknowledge, however, that the coachmen are provided by their masters with furred coats and gloves, and that in the event of the cold being unusual, if any nobleman gives a party or a ball, he has strong liquor distributed among them, and wood to build campfires in the courtyard and the street. The common people of Russia are in general ugly. 
but their behavior is at once simple and dignified and they are the best creatures in the world one never sees a drunken man although the popular beverage is corn brandy most of the russians of this class live on potatoes and garlic with oil which they eat with their bread so that they always stink although it is their habit to take a bath every saturday but their food does not prevent them from singing loudly when at work or rowing their boats and they often reminded me of something the marquis de chasteloup said one evening at my house about the beginning of the revolution if their bonds are taken off they will be much more unhappy the russians are clever and capable since they learn all trades with great ease some of them even gaining success in the arts one day at count stroganoff's i saw an architect who had once been his serf this young man exhibited so much talent that the count had made a present of him to the emperor paul who made him one of his architects and ordered him to build a theatre hall after the plans designed and submitted by him i never saw the hall but was told that it was very handsome in the matter of artistic serfs i was less fortunate than the count as i found myself without a manservant after being robbed by one i brought from vienna count stroganoff gave me one of his serfs who was supposed to prepare his daughter-in-law's palette and clean her brushes when she amused herself with painting this youth whom i therefore engaged for the same purpose became persuaded after serving me for a fortnight that he was a painter too and gave me no rest until i had obtained his freedom from the count to enable him to work with the academy students he wrote me some letters on this subject that were really curiosities of style and ideas the count in yielding to my request had said you may be sure that before long he will want to come back i gave the young man twenty roubles and the count gave him at least as much accordingly he at once hastened to purchase the uniform of the students in painting and thus attired came to thank me with a triumphant air about two months later he brought me a large family picture which was so bad that i could not look at it and for which the poor young man had been paid so little that after liquidating all his expenses he had lost eight roubles of his money as the count had foreseen his disappointment made him surrender his wretched liberty and go back to his master the servants are remarkable for their intelligence i had one who knew not a word of french and although i was equally ignorant of russian we understood each other perfectly without the agency of speech by raising my arm i asked him for my easel or my paint box or otherwise conveyed to him by gesture what articles i wanted he invariably seized my meaning and was of the greatest value to me another very precious quality i discovered in him was his honesty which was proof against all temptations frequently banknotes were remitted to me in payment of my pictures and when i was busy painting i laid them near me on a table on quitting work i constantly forgot to take away the notes which sometimes lay there three or four days without his ever abstracting one moreover he was a man of exceptional sobriety i never once saw him drunk this good servant was called peter he wept when i left st petersburg and i have always sincerely regretted losing him the russian people in general are honest and gentle by nature at st petersburg or moscow not only are great crimes never heard of but one never hears of thefts this good and quiet behavior surprising in men little beyond barbarism is attributed by many to the system of servitude they are under as for me i believe the reason to be that the russians are extremely religious not long after my arrival at st petersburg i went into the country to see the daughter-in-law of my old friend count stroganoff his house at kaminostrov was situated at the right of the great highway skirting the neva i alighted from my carriage opened a little wicket giving admission to the garden and reached a room on the ground floor whose door was wide open so it was very easy to enter countess stroganoff's house 
Consequently, when I found her in a little sitting-room, and she showed me her apartments, I was greatly astonished to see all her jewels near a window, looking out on the garden, and therefore within close reach of the high road. This seemed to me the more imprudent, as Russian ladies are in the habit of exhibiting their diamonds and other ornaments under large cases, such as are to be seen in jewellers' shops. Countess, I asked her, are you not afraid of being robbed? No, was her answer. There are the best police. And she pointed out above the jewel box various images of the Virgin and St. Nicholas, the patron saint of the country, with a lamp burning in front of them. It is a fact that during the seven years and more which I spent in Russia, I on all occasions observed the image of the Virgin or of a saint and the presence of a child to have something sacred for a Russian. The common people, in speaking to you, never address you otherwise, according to your age, than as mother, father, brother, or sister. And in this usage everyone is included, even the emperor and the empress, and the whole imperial family. In the class above the populace there are a number of people in comfortable circumstances, and others very well to do. The tradesmen's wives, for instance, spend a great deal on dress, without this appearing to impose any restriction on household expenses. Their headdress, especially, is always fine and fashionable. On their caps, whose flaps are usually embroidered with small pearls, they wear a broad piece of stuff which falls from the head to the shoulders and down the whole back. This sort of veil throws a shadow on the face, which they assuredly need, seeing that all of them, I know not why, whiten and rouge their faces and pencil their eyebrows in the most absurd manner. When the month of May comes to St. Petersburg, there is no evidence of spring flowers embalming the air, nor of the nightingale's song, celebrated so much by the poets. The ground is covered with half-melted snow. The doja brings into the Neva ice blocks as large as enormous rocks heaped on top of each other. And these ice blocks renew the cold, which has diminished with the breaking of the Neva. This disillusion might be called a splendid horror. The noise of it is fearful. Close to the exchange, the Neva is three times as wide as the Seine at the Pont Royal. And one may imagine the effect of this sea of ice cracking in all its parts. In spite of the officials posted all along the quays to prohibit the people from jumping from flow to flow, the boldest venture upon the moving ice for the purpose of crossing the river. Before undertaking their dangerous expedition, they make the sign of the cross, and then rush on, fully persuaded that if they perish, it must be because they were predestined to it. The first who crosses the Neva in a boat at the hour of the breaking up presents a silver cup full of river water to the emperor, who in turn fills it with gold. The windows are still left stuffed up at this season. Russia has no spring, but the vegetation hastens to make up for lost time. One may say with literal truth that the leaves sprout while you watch them. One day at the end of May I went with my daughter for a walk in the summer garden, and, wishing to assure ourselves as to the truth of all we had heard concerning the rapidity of vegetable growth, we took note of some shrub leaves that were only in bud. We took a long turn in the avenue, then coming back to the spot we had started from, we found the buds open and the leaves completely unrolled. The Russians take advantage of all phases of their climate to enjoy themselves. In the severest cold they indulge in sledging parties, either by day or with torches at night. In some places they throw up mountains of snow, down which they slide at a stupendous rate of speed without any danger. Men versed in their business push you off from the top of the mountain, and others catch you at the bottom. One of the most interesting ceremonies to be seen is the blessing of the Neva. It occurs once a year, 
and it is the archimandrite who bestows the benediction in presence of the emperor the imperial family and all the dignitaries as at this season the ice of the neva is at least three feet thick a hole is made through which after the ceremony everybody draws up some of the holy water frequently women are seen to dip their little children in and sometimes the unfortunate mothers let loose their hold of the poor victims of superstition but instead of mourning the loss of her child the mother then gives thanks for the happiness of the angel who has gone to pray for her the emperor is obliged to drink the first glass of water it being tendered him by the archimandrite i have already said that in st petersburg you must go out into the street to find out how cold it is and it is likewise true that the russians are not content with giving their houses a spring-like temperature some of their rooms are lined with windowed screens behind which are arranged boxes and pots containing the lovely flowers that the month of may gives to france in winter the rooms are lighted most elaborately they are also scented with hot vinegar into which bits of mint have been thrown and which yields a very agreeable and healthy smell all apartments are furnished with long broad divans for men and women to sit on i became so used to them that after a time i could not sit on a chair the russian lady's salute is a bow seeming to me more dignified and graceful than our courtesy they do not ring for their servants but signal to them by clapping their hands together as sultanas are said to do in the harems every russian lady has a man in full livery at the door of her drawing-room he is always there to open the door for visitors whom it was at that time the custom not to announce by name but what seemed stranger still to me was that some of these ladies made a female serf sleep under their bed of an evening i went out into society there were innumerable balls concerts and theatrical performances and i thoroughly enjoyed these gatherings where i found all the urbanity all the grace of french company it seemed as though good taste had made a jump with both feet from paris to st petersburg nor was there a lack of open houses and in all of them one was welcomed with the greatest hospitality one met at about eight and supped at ten in the meantime tea was drunk like everywhere else but the russian tea is so excellent that i with whom it does not agree and who must abstain from it was glad to inhale its aroma instead of tea i drank hydromel this tasty beverage is made with good honey and a small fruit picked in the russian woods it is left in the cellar for a certain length of time before bottling i found it far preferable to cider beer or even lemonade end of chapter eight recording by james k white chula vista chapter nine of memoirs of madame vigie lebrun this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Memoirs of Madame Vigie Le Bon by Elizabeth Louise Vigie Le Bon. Translated by Lionel Strachey. Chapter 9. Catherine the Second i experienced a great joy when after breathing frosty air outdoors and air heated by stoves indoors for several months i witnessed the arrival of summer i took a great delight in the walks and hastened to enjoy the beautiful surroundings of st petersburg i very often went to the lake of pergola alone with my russian manservant to take what i called an air bath i enjoyed the contemplation of its limpid water which vividly reflected the trees on its banks and then i would mount to the heights adjacent on one side the horizon was bounded by the sea and i could distinguish the sails lit up by the sun here a silence reigned that was disturbed only by the song of a thousand birds or sometimes by the sound of a distant bell 
the pure air and the wild picturesque place enchanted me my faithful peter who warmed up my little dinner or picked flowers of the field for me made me think of robinson on his island with friday the heat being considerable i often went with my daughter for early walks on the island of krestovsky the extreme point of this island seemed to merge into the sea on which large vessels were navigating sometimes we went there in the evening to see the russian peasants dance their national dress being very picturesque i remember on the subject of the excessive heat often prevailing at st petersburg a certain day in the month of july of some year in which that month was hotter than in italy on this day i saw princess dolgoruki's mother princess Beriatinsky, who was once as lovely as an angel and whose clever and spontaneous wit rendered her one of the most fascinating women of st petersburg established in her cellar with her lady's companion seated on the bottom step very quietly reading to her from a book but to return to the island of krestovsky taking a row in a boat one day we came upon a crowd of men and women all bathing together we even saw from a distance young men naked on horseback who were thus bathing with their horses in any other country one would have been shocked by this but the russian people are really primitively ingenious in the winter husband wife and children sleep together on the stove if the stove is not large enough they lie on wooden benches lining their hut wrapped up simply in their sheepskins these good people have kept the customs of the ancient patriarchs a walk which pleased me particularly was one on the island of zelagin which though it had once been a very handsome garden was now deserted however there remain some lovely trees charming avenues a temple surrounded with magnificent weeping willows flowers to please the eye little running streams and bridges after the english fashion in order to enjoy this walk to the full i took a little house opposite on the bank of the neva the advantageous situation of my cottage was combined with pleasing diversion due to the fact that most of the boats of which there was an unceasing procession up and down the river gave me a continuous concert of vocal music or wind instruments the artillery general melissimo lived in a pretty house close to mine and i enjoyed having him for my neighbor since he was the best and most obliging of men as the general had spent much time in turkey his house was a model of oriental comfort and luxury there was a bathroom lighted from above in the middle of which was a basin large enough to hold a dozen people one went down into the water by steps linen to be used for drying the body after bathing was hung on a golden balustrade circling the basin and consisted of large pieces of indian mull worked at the bottom in flowers and gold so that the weight of this embroidery caused the mole to adhere to the skin which appeared to me an elaborate refinement round the room ran a broad divan on which one could stretch oneself and rest after taking a bath and one of the doors opened from a sweet little sitting-room this sitting-room again overlooked an odorous flower-bed and some of the stems grew to the height of the window it was in this room that the general gave us a breakfast of fruits cream cheese and excellent mocha coffee on all of which my daughter regaled herself royally another time he asked us to a very good dinner and had it served under a turkish tent brought back from one of his journeys the tent was put up on the lawn facing the house there were twelve of us all seated by the table on splendid divans we were served with delicious fruits at dessert the whole dinner was quite asiatic and the general's courtesy added to the savor of all the good things i wish however that he had omitted firing off cannon shots in our immediate proximity just as we were sitting down at table but i was informed that such was the custom with all generals i took my little house on the neva for one summer only the next young count stroganoff lent me one at kamenstroff where i was very well suited every morning i walked alone in a neighboring wood and passed my evenings with countess golovin my neighbor there i met young prince beriatinsky princess tarrant 
and various other congenial people. We would chat or have readings until supper time. In fact, time was speeding by for me in the most agreeable manner. The Russian people lived very happily under the rule of Catherine. By great and lowly have I heard the name of her blessed, to whom the nation owed so much glory and so much well-being. I do not speak of the conquests by which the national vanity was so prodigiously flattered, but of the real, lasting good that this empress did her people. During the space of the thirty-four years she reigned, her beneficent genius fathered or furthered all that was useful, all that was grand. She erected an immortal monument to Peter I. She built two hundred and thirty-seven towns in stone, saying that wooden villages cost much more because they burned down so often. She covered the sea with her fleets. She established everywhere manufactories and banks, highly propitious to the commerce of St. Petersburg, Moscow, and Tobolsk. She granted new privileges to the academy. She founded schools in all the towns and the country districts. She dug canals, built granite quays, gave a legal code, instituted an asylum for foundlings, and, finally, introduced into her empire the boon of vaccination, adopted by the Russians solely through her mighty will and, for the public encouragement, was the first to be inoculated. Catherine herself was the source of all these blessings, for she never allowed anyone else real authority. She dictated her own dispatches to her ministers, who, in effect, were but her secretaries. I am much annoyed that the Duchess d'Avantes, who has recently published a work on Catherine II, has either not read what the Prince de Ligny and the Comte de Segur have written, or has not given credence to those irrefutable witnesses. If she had, she would have more justly appreciated and admired the qualities distinguishing that great empress, considering her as a ruler, and she would have paid more respect to the memory of a woman in whom our sex ought to take pride for so many reasons. Catherine II loved everything that was magnificent in the arts. At the Hermitage she built a set of rooms, corresponding to certain rooms in the Vatican, and had copies made of the fifty pictures by Raphael adorning those rooms. She enriched the Academy of Fine Arts with plaster casts of the finest ancient statues, and with a large number of paintings by various masters. The hermitage which she had founded and erected quite near her palace was a model of good taste in every respect and made the clumsy architecture of the imperial palace at St. Petersburg appear to worse advantage than ever by the contrast. It is well known that she wrote French with great facility. In the library at St. Petersburg I saw the original manuscript of the legal code she gave the Russians, written entirely in her own hand and in the French language. Her style, I was told, was elegant and very concise and this reminds me of an instance of her laconic manner of expression, which seems to me quite delightful. When General Suvorov had won the Battle of Warsaw, Catherine at once sent him a messenger, and this messenger brought the fortunate victor nothing but an envelope on which she had written with her own hand to Marshal Suvorov. This woman, whose power was so great, was at home the simplest and least exacting of women. She rose at five in the morning, lit her fire, and then made her coffee herself. It was even said that one day, having lit the fire without being aware that the sweeper had climbed up the chimney, the sweeper began to swear at her, and to shower the coarsest revilements upon her, believing he was speaking to a stove-lighter. The empress hastened to extinguish the fire, though not without laughing heartily at having been thus treated. After breakfast, the empress wrote her letters and prepared her dispatches, remaining in seclusion until nine o'clock. She then rang for her men-servants, who sometimes did not answer her bell. One day, for instance, impatient at waiting, she opened the door of the room they were in, and finding them settled down at a game of cards, she asked them why they did not come when she rang. Thereupon one of them calmly replied that they wanted to finish their game, and so they did. On another occasion, the Comtesse Bruce, who was allowed in the Empress's apartments at all hours, came in one morning to find her alone at her toilette. 
"'Your Majesty seems to be without assistance,' said the Countess. "'How can I help it?' answered the Empress. "'My maids all went off. "'I was trying on a dress which fitted so badly "'that I lost my temper over it, "'and so they left me to myself. "'Not one of them stayed, not even Reynette, my head maid, "'and I am waiting for them to cool off.' "'In the evening Catherine would gather about her "'some of the people of her court she liked best.' She sent for her grandchildren, and Blind Man's Bluff, Hunt the Slipper, and other games were played until ten o'clock, when Her Majesty went to bed. Princess Dolgoruki, who was among the favored, often told me with what good spirits and jollity the Empress enlivened these gatherings. Comte Stekelberg and the Comte de Segur were invited to Catherine's small parties. When she broke with France and dismissed the Comte de Segur, the French ambassador, she expressed deep regret at losing him. But, she added, I am an autocrat. Everyone to his trade. Many persons have attributed Catherine's death to the keen sorrow brought her by the failure of the marriage arranged between her granddaughter, the Duchess Alexandrina, and the King of Sweden. That prince arrived at St. Petersburg with his uncle, the Duke of Sudermania, in August 1796. He was only seventeen years old, but his tall figure and his proud and noble bearing made him respected in spite of his youth. Having been very carefully brought up, he showed a most unusual politeness. The princess, whom he had come to marry, and who was fourteen, was lovely as an angel, and he speedily fell deeply in love with her. I remember that when he came to my house to see the portrait I had done of his bride-elect, he looked at it with such rapt attention that his hat fell from his hand. The empress wished for this marriage more than anything, but she insisted that her granddaughter should have a chapel and clergy of her own religion in the palace at Stockholm. But the young king, all his love for the young duchess Alexandrina notwithstanding, would not consent to anything that would violate the laws of his country. Knowing that Catherine had sent for the patriarch, to pronounce the betrothal after a ball in the evening, the king remained absent from the ball, despite Monsieur de Markov's repeated calls urging him to come. I was then doing the portrait of Count Diedrichstein. We went to my window several times to see if the young king would yield and go to the ball, but he did not. In the end, according to what Princess Dolgoruki told me, when everyone was assembled, the empress half opened the door of her room and said in a very subdued voice, Ladies, there will be no ball tonight. The King of Sweden and the Duke of Sudermania left St. Petersburg the next morning. Whether or no it was the grief arising from this occurrence that cut short the days of Catherine, Russia was soon to lose her. The Sunday preceding her death, I went to Her Majesty after church to present her with the portrait that I had made of the Grand Duchess Elizabeth. She congratulated me upon my work, and then said, They insist that you must take my portrait. I am very old, but still, as they all wish it, I will give you the first sitting this day week. The following Thursday she did not ring at nine o'clock, as was her wont. The servants waited until ten o'clock, and even a little later. At last the headmaid went in. Not seeing the empress in her room, she went to the clothes closet, and no sooner did she open the door than Catherine's body fell upon the floor. It was impossible to discover at what hour the apoplectic shock had touched her. However, her pulse was still beating, and hope was not entirely given up. Never in my days did I see such lively alarm spread so generally. For my part, I was so seized with pain and terror when apprised of the dreadful tidings that my convalescing daughter, perceiving my state of prostration, became again ill. After dinner, I hastened to Princess Dolgoruki's, whither Comte Cobenzel brought us the news every ten minutes from the palace. Our anxiety continued to grow, and was unbearable for everybody, since not only did the nation worship Catherine, but it had an awful dread of being governed by Paul. Toward evening, Paul arrived from a place near St. Petersburg, where he lived most of the time. 
when he saw his mother lying senseless nature for a moment asserted her rights he approached the empress kissed her hand and shed some tears catherine the second finally expired at nine o'clock on the evening of november seventeenth seventeen ninety six Count Cobenzel, who saw her breathe her last sigh, at once came to inform us that she had ceased to live. I confess that I did not leave Princess Dolgoruki's devoid of fear, in view of the general talk as to a probable revolution against Paul. The immense mob I saw on my way home in the palace square by no means tended to comfort me. Nevertheless, all those people were so quiet that I soon concluded and rightly we had nothing to fear for the moment the next morning the populace gathered again at the same place giving vent to its grief under catherine's windows in heart-rending cries old men and young as well as children called to their matusha little mother and between their sobs lamented that they had lost everything this day was the more depressing as it augured so sadly for the prince succeeding to the throne the empress's body was exposed six weeks in a large room at the palace lit up day and night and gorgeously decorated catherine was laid out on a bed of state and surrounded by shields bearing the arms of all the towns in the empire her face was uncovered her beautiful hand resting on the bed all the ladies of whom some took turn in watching by the body bent to kiss that hand or pretended to I, who had never kissed it in her lifetime, did not dare to kiss it now, and even avoided looking at Catherine's face, which would have left too bad an impression on my memory. After his mother's death, Paul at once had his father Peter disinterred. He had been buried for thirty-five years in the convent of Alexander Nevsky. Nothing was found in the coffin but bones and a sleeve of Peter's uniform. Paul desired the same honors rendered to these remains as to Catherine's. He had them exhibited in the middle of the church at Kazan. The watch service was performed by old officers, friends of Peter III, whom his son had pressed to come, and whom he loaded with honors. The day of the funeral having arrived, Peter III's coffin, on which his son had placed a crown, was put with great ceremony beside Catherine's and both were conveyed to the citadel, Peter's preceding, it being Paul's wish to humble his mother's ashes. I saw the marvellous procession from my window as one sees a play from a box in the theatre. Before the emperor's coffin rode a horseman of the guard, clad from top to toe in golden armour. But the man riding in front of the empress's coffin wore only steel armour. The murderers of Peter the Third were, by order of his son, obliged to act as pallbearers. The new emperor walked in the procession on foot, bareheaded, with his wife and the whole court, which was very numerous, and attired in deep mourning. The women wore long trains and enormous black veils. They were obliged to walk in the snow at a very low temperature from the palace to the fortress where Russia's sovereigns were laid to rest, a long distance on the other side of the Neva. Mourning was ordered for six months. The women's hair was brushed back, and their headgear came to a point on the forehead, which did not improve their looks at all. But this slight inconvenience was insignificant compared to the deep anxiety to which the empress's death gave rise throughout the whole empire. End of chapter 9. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Chapter 10 of Memoirs of Madame Vigie Le Bon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Memoirs of Madame Vigie Le Bon by Elizabeth Louise Vigie Le Bon. Translated by Lionel Strachey. Chapter 10. The Emperor Paul. The Emperor Paul, born October 1, 1754, 
ascended the throne on the 12th of December, 1796. What I have related touching Catherine's funeral is sufficient proof that the new emperor did not share the national sorrow. It is well known besides that he bestowed the order of St. Andrew upon Nicholas Zuboff, who brought him the news of his mother's death. Paul was clever, well-informed, and energetic, but his whims bordered on insanity. In this unhappy prince, generous emotions were often followed by outbreaks of ferocity. Approval or anger, favor or resentment, were, with him, altogether a matter of caprice. One night I was at a court ball. Everyone except the emperor was masked. Both men and women were wearing black dominoes. One of the doorways between two rooms became crowded, and a young man in haste to pass elbowed a woman who began to scream. Paul at once turned to one of his adjutants, saying, Take that gentleman to the fortress and come back to tell me that he is safe under lock and key. The adjutant soon came back to tell the emperor that he had executed his order. But, he went on, your majesty must know that the young man is very short-sighted. Here is the proof. And he produced the prisoner's eyeglasses which he had brought with him. Paul, after trying the eyeglasses, was convinced, and said with feeling, Go for him quickly, and take him to his parents. I shall not go to bed until you have come back with the information that he is at home again. The least infraction of Paul's commands was punished with exile to Siberia, or at least with imprisonment, so that, unable to foresee how far lunacy and arbitrariness combined would go, one lived in a state of perpetual fear. It soon came to one's not daring to invite company to one's house. If one would see a few friends, one was very careful to close the shutters. And when a ball was given, it was agreed that the carriages should be sent home, so as to attract less attention. Everybody's words and actions were watched to such an extent that I heard it said there was no social circle without a spy. Allusion to the emperor was usually abstained from altogether. I remember how, one day, joining a very small gathering, a lady who did not know me and who had just ventured upon this subject cut her words short when she saw me coming into the room. Countess Golovin was obliged to tell her that she might continue. You may speak without fear, she said. It is Madame Lebrun. All this seemed extremely burdensome after living under Catherine, who allowed everyone to enjoy entire liberty without, however, using the word. It would take a long time to recount to what futilities Paul practiced his tyranny. He ordered, for instance, that everyone should make obeisance to his palace, even when he was absent. He forbade the wearing of round hats, which he looked upon as a symbol of Jacobinism. The police knocked off with their sticks all the round hats they saw, to the great annoyance of people whose ignorance of the regulation exposed them to being thus unhatted. On the other hand, everyone was obliged to wear powder. At the time when this regulation was made, I was painting young Prince Beriatinsky's portrait, and he had acceded to my request that he come without powder. One day he arrived pale as death. "'What is the matter with you?' I asked him. "'I have just met the Emperor,' he replied, all a-tremble. "'I barely had time to hide in a doorway.' but I am terribly afraid that he recognized me. There was nothing surprising in Prince Beriatinsky's fright. All classes were likewise affected, for no inhabitant of St. Petersburg was sure one night that he would sleep in his bed the next. For my part, I avow that in the reign of Paul I experienced the greatest fear of all my life. I had gone to Pergola to spend the day, and had with me Monsieur de Riviere, my coachman, and Peter, my faithful Russian servant. While Monsieur de Riviere was walking about with his gun to shoot birds or rabbits, to which, by the way, he never did great harm, I remained on the shore of the lake. All of a sudden I noticed the fire that had been lit to cook our dinner communicate itself to the trees and spread with great rapidity. The trees were close together, and Pergola was close to St. Petersburg. 
I began to scream dreadfully, calling upon Monsieur de Riviere, and, aided by fear, the four of us succeeded in extinguishing the blaze, though not without severely burning our hands. But we thought of the Emperor, of Siberia, and it may well be imagined how this filled us with zeal. I can only explain the terror that Paul inspired me with from the fact that it was universal, since I must admit that toward myself he was never anything but civil and considerate. When I saw him for the first time at St. Petersburg, he was amiable enough to remember that I had been presented to him in Paris on the occasion of his visit there. I was very young then, and so many years had since gone by that I had forgotten the incident. But princes, as a rule, are gifted with a memory for faces and names. Among the various queer ordinances of his reign, one to which obedience was very troublesome, compelled both men and women to alight from their carriages whenever the emperor drove by. Now I must add that Paul was to be met with very frequently in the streets of St. Petersburg, as he travelled them perpetually, sometimes on horseback with but slim attendants, and sometimes in a sledge without an escort, without any sign by which he might have been recognised. You were, nevertheless, obliged to obey his command, under pain of incurring his severest displeasure. And it will be agreed that it was cruel to have to jump out into the snow and stand there, however extreme the cold. One day, when I was out driving, my coachman not having observed his approach, I scarcely had time to exclaim, Stop! It is the emperor! But, as my door was opened and I was about to get out, the emperor himself descended from his sledge and hastened to stop me, saying in the most gracious manner that his order did not concern foreign ladies, especially Madame Lebrun. The reason why even Paul's most favorable whims were not reassuring for the future was that no man was ever more changeable in his tastes and affections. At the beginning of his reign, for instance, he loathed Bonaparte, Later on he conceived such a great tenderness for him that a portrait of the French hero was kept in his sanctuary, and he exhibited it to everyone. Neither his dislike nor his favor was lasting. Count Stroganoff, I believe, is the only person he always loved and esteemed. He was not known to have favorites among the gentlemen of the court, but was very fond of a French actor called Frogere, who was not without talent and rather clever. Frogier went into the emperor's study at all hours, unannounced. They were often seen walking together in the gardens, arm in arm, chatting on the subject of French literature, for which Paul had a strong fancy, particularly our drama. This actor was often invited to the small court gatherings, and as he was highly gifted in the art of joking, he made the greatest lords the object of jokes, which amused the emperor very much but which probably were very slightly amusing to those at whose expense they were made. The Grand Dukes themselves were not safe from Frogere's naughty pleasantries. In fact, after the death of Paul, he did not venture to appear at the palace. The Emperor Alexander, walking alone one day in the streets of Moscow, met him and called to him, Frogere, why have you not been to see me? The Emperor asked him with affable air. Sire, replied Frogere, freed from his fears, I did not know your majesty's address. The emperor laughed a great deal over this piece of nonsense, and munificently paid the French actor some arrears in salary which the poor man had up till then not dared to claim. After dealing for a long time with Paul, it was indeed natural that Frogere should dread the resentment of a sovereign for Paul was so vindictive that the greatest share of his wrongdoings was attributable to his hatred for the Russian nobility, against whom he had had a grievance during Catherine's lifetime. In this hatred he confused the innocent with the guilty, detesting all the great nobles, and taking a delight in humbling any of them he did not exile. To foreigners, on the other hand, and especially to the French, he showed remarkable kindness, and I must here affirm that he always received and treated well all travellers and refugees coming from France. Of these last, some were even generously assisted by him. I will mention as an instance the Comte d'Artichon, 
who finding himself in st petersburg without any resources whatever had hit upon the idea of making a very pretty elastic shoe i bought a pair which the same evening i showed to several women of the court at princess dolgoruki's they were pronounced charming and this together with the sympathy inspired by the refugee resulted in immediate orders for a large number of pairs the little shoe eventually came under the notice of the emperor who as soon as he learned the name of the workman sent for him and gave him a fine position unfortunately it was a confidential post and the russians were so offended that paul could not leave the comte d'autichon in it for long but he made amends in such a way as to secure him against poverty several facts of this kind i confess made me more indulgent toward the emperor than the russians were whose peace was incessantly disturbed through the extravagant caprices of an omnipotent madman it would be difficult to convey an idea of the fears the discontent and the secret murmurings of his court that i had formerly seen so placid and happy it may be said with truth that as long as paul's reign lasted terror was the order of the day as one cannot torment one's fellow men without being tormented oneself paul was far from leading an enviable life he had a fixed idea that he would die by steel or by poison and this conviction explains much of his queer conduct while going about the streets of st petersburg alone at all hours of the day and night he took the precaution to have his broth made in his room and the rest of his cooking was likewise done in the secrecy of his apartment the whole was superintended by his faithful kutasov a confidential valet who had been to paris with him and was in constant attendance upon him this kutasov had entertained an unlimited devotion for the emperor and nothing could ever change it paul was exceedingly ugly a flat nose and a very large mouth furnished with very long teeth made him look like a death's head his eyes were more than vivacious though they often had a soft expression he was neither stout nor lean neither tall nor short and although his whole person was not wanting in a sort of elegance it must be admitted that his face suggested opportunity for caricature indeed a number were made in spite of the danger that such an amusement threatened one of them represented him holding a paper in each hand on one was written order on the other counter order and on his forehead disorder at the mere mention of this caricature i still feel a little shiver for it must be understood that there were lives in jeopardy in which the artists and the purchasers were included but all i have said did not hinder st petersburg from being a pleasant as well as profitable place of sojourn for a painter the emperor paul loved and patronized the arts a great admirer of french literature he munificently subsidized the actors to whom he owed the pleasure of seeing our dramatic masterpieces performed doyen my father's friend and the historical painter i have already mentioned was distinguished by paul as he had been by catherine the second though very old at the time doyen who had imposed a simple and frugal manner of living upon himself had accepted but a portion of the empress's generous offers the emperor continued in the path of catherine and ordered a ceiling for the new palace of st michael as yet unfurnished the room where doyen was working was close to the hermitage paul and all the court passed through it on their way to mass and the emperor rarely returned without stopping to chat for more or less time with the painter in quite amiable fashion i am hereby reminded how one day one of the emperor's gentlemen in waiting stepped up to doyen and said permit me sir to make a slight observation you are painting the hours dancing round the chariot of the sun i see one there in the distance smaller than the rest the hours however are all exactly alike sir replied doyen with cool self-possession you are perfectly right but what you point out is only a half hour the first speaker nodded in assent and went off greatly pleased with himself 
i must not forget to record that the emperor wishing to pay the price of painting the ceiling before it was finished sent to doyen a banknote for a large sum how much i do not now remember but the banknote was enclosed in a wrapper upon which paul had written with his own hand here is something to buy colors with as for oil there is a lot left in the lamp if my father's old friend was pleased with his life at st petersburg i was none the less pleased with mine i worked without relaxing from morning till evening only on sundays i lost two hours which i was obliged to grant people wishing to see my studio and among these there were frequently grand dukes and grand duchesses besides the pictures i have already spoken of and an endless succession of portraits i had sent to paris for my large portrait of queen marie antoinette one in which i had painted her in a blue velvet dress and the general interest it provoked yielded me the sweetest delight the prince de conde then at st petersburg on coming to see it uttered not a word but burst into tears in respect of social amenity st petersburg left nothing to be desired one might have believed oneself at paris so many french were there at the fashionable gatherings it was thus that i saw the duke richelieu and the comte de langeron again they were really not residents the first being governor of odessa and the other always travelling on military inspections but it was different with a host of other countrymen of mine for instance i made acquaintance with the amiable and dear good comtesse du crest de villeneuve not only was this young woman very pretty and very well built but she had a special charm coming from her great goodness of heart i often saw her at st petersburg as well as at moscow by which i am reminded that one day when i went to dine with her an instance occurred of a kind not rare in russia but which frightened me excessively monsieur ducrest de villeneuve came for me in a sledge and it was so cold that my forehead was quite frozen i exclaimed in terror i shall be able to think no more monsieur de villeneuve hurried me into a shop where my forehead was rubbed with snow and this remedy employed by the russians in all similar cases soon banished the cause of my despair i did not neglect the natives who treated me so well for my french friends and my relations with russian families were constantly increasing besides the numerous persons i have already mentioned i often saw m dimidov the richest private gentleman in russia his father had left him a heritage of richly productive iron and quicksilver mines and the enormous sales he made to the government kept on enlarging his fortune his immense wealth was the cause of his obtaining in marriage mademoiselle stroganov a member of one of the most aristocratic and oldest families of russia their union was very happy they left only two sons one of whom lives in paris most of the time and who like his father has a great love of pictures the emperor ordered me to make a portrait of his wife i represented her standing wearing a court dress and a diamond crown on her head i do not like painting diamonds the brush cannot render their brilliancy nevertheless in taking for a background a large crimson velvet curtain i succeeded in making the crown shine as much as possible when i sent for the picture to finish the details at home the empress wanted to lend me the court dress and all the jewels belonging to it but they were so valuable that i declined to accept the trust which would have given me too much anxiety i preferred to finish my painting at the palace whither i had the picture taken back the empress maria was a very handsome woman her plumpness kept her fresh she had a tall figure full of dignity and magnificent fair hair i recollect having seen her at a great ball with her beautiful locks falling at each side of her shoulders and a diamond tiara on the top of her head this tall and handsome woman walked majestically next to paul on his arm and a striking contrast was thus presented to all her loveliness was added a sweet character the empress maria was truly the woman of the gospel her virtues were so universally known that she perhaps affords the only example of a woman never attacked by slander 
I confess I was proud to find myself honored with her favor, and that I set great store by the goodwill she showed me on all occasions. Our sittings took place immediately after the court dinner, so that the emperor and his two sons, Alexander and Constantine, were habitually present. These august spectators did not annoy me in the least, especially as the emperor, who alone could have made me feel any diffidence, was exceedingly polite to me. One day, when coffee was being served, as I was already at my easel, he brought me a cup himself, and then waited until I had drunk the coffee to take back the cup and put it away. Another time, it is true, he made me witness a rather comical scene. I was having a screen put behind the empress in order to obtain a quiet background. In this moment of intermission, Paul began cutting up a thousand antics, exactly like a monkey, scratching the screen and pretending to climb up it. Alexander and Constantine seemed pained at their father's grotesque behavior before a stranger, and I myself felt sorry on their account. During one of the sittings, the empress sent for her two youngest sons, the Grand Duke Nicholas and the Grand Duke Michael. Never have I seen a finer child than the Grand Duke Nicholas, the present emperor. I could, I believe, paint him from memory today. So much did I admire his enchanting face, which bore all the characteristics of Greek beauty. I remember, too, a type of beauty of an altogether different kind, an old man, Although in Russia the emperor is the supreme head of the church, as well as of the government and the army, the religious power is held under him by the first pope, called the Great Archimandrite, who is about the same to the Russians as the Holy Father is to us. While living in St. Petersburg, I had often heard of the merit and virtues of the divine occupying this post and one day some of my acquaintances who were going to visit him, proposing to take me with them, I eagerly accepted their invitation. Never in my life had I been in the presence of such an imposing man. His figure was tall and majestic. His handsome face, whose every feature was endowed with perfect regularity, expressed at once a gentleness and a nobility difficult to describe. A long white beard falling below the chest, added to the venerable appearance of his magnificent head. His dress was simple and dignified. He wore a long white robe, divided in front from top to bottom by a broad strip of black material, which made the whiteness of his beard stand out admirably. His walk, his gestures, his glance, everything about him commanded respect from the very first. The great Archimandrite was a superior man, he had a profound mind and great learning, and spoke several languages. Besides, by reason of his virtues and kindness, he was cherished by all who knew him. His grave vocation never prevented him from being affable and gracious toward high society. One of the princesses, Galatzin, who was very beautiful, seeing him in a garden one day, ran to throw herself on her knees before him. The old man at once picked a rose and gave it to her, accompanying it with his blessing. One of my regrets on leaving St. Petersburg was my not having done the Archimandrite's portrait, for I believe no painter could ever meet with a finer model. End of chapter 10 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista Chapter 11 of Memoirs of Madame Vigi Le Bon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Memoirs of Madame Vigi Le Bon by Elizabeth Louise Vigi Le Bon. Translated by Lionel Strachey. Chapter 11 family affairs i will now speak of a man i frequently saw for whom i entertained a lively friendship and who after wearing a crown was then living in st petersburg as a private gentleman this was stanislaus augustus poniatowski poland's last king 
in my early youth i had heard this prince who had not then ascended the throne talked of by people in the habit of meeting him at madame joffrine's where he often went to dinner all his companions of that date praised his amiability and his good looks for his good or his harm it is difficult to decide which he made a journey to st petersburg catherine the second showed him every distinction and helped him with all her might to become king of poland poniatowski was crowned in september of the year seventeen sixty four but this same catherine destroyed her own work and overthrew the monarch she had so heartily helped the ruin of poland once determined replin and stakelberg the russian envoys became the actual rulers of this unfortunate kingdom and so remained until the day it ceased to exist their court became more numerous than that of the prince whom they continually insulted with impunity and who was king in name only stanislaus augustus poniatowski was kind-hearted and very brave but perhaps he wanted the necessary energy to hold down the spirit of rebellion reigning in his country he did everything to make himself agreeable to the nobility and the people and he partly succeeded but there were so many disorderly interior elements in addition to the scheme of the three great neighboring powers for the seizure of poland that it would have been a miracle had he triumphed he ultimately succumbed and retired to grodno where he lived on a pension allowed him by russia prussia and austria who had divided his kingdom between them after the death of catherine the second the emperor paul invited poniatowski to st petersburg to be present at his coronation during the whole ceremony which was very long the ex-king was allowed to stand which in view of his advanced years pained everybody there paul afterward behaved more civilly when he asked him to stay at st petersburg and lodged him in a marble palace to be seen on a fine quay of the neva the king of poland was now suitably housed he created an agreeable social circle for himself largely composed of french to whom were added some other foreigners he wished to honor he was so extremely good as to seek me out to bid me to his private parties and he called me his dear friend as prince kunitz did at vienna nothing touched me more than to hear him repeat that it would have made him glad to have me at warsaw while he was still king i was aware in fact how at that time someone having told him i was going to poland he had replied that he would treat me with the greatest distinction but i am sure that every allusion to the past must have been very painful to him he was very tall his handsome face expressed gentleness and kindness his voice was resounding and his walk erect without conceit his conversation had a particular charm since he loved and knew literature to a high degree he was so passionately fond of the arts that at warsaw when he was king he perpetually went to visit the best artists he was more considerate than can possibly be imagined i recollect being given a proof that makes me feel rather ashamed when i think of it sometimes when i am painting i refuse to see any one in the world but my model which more than once has made me rude to people coming to disturb me at my work one morning when i was occupied with finishing a portrait the king of poland came to see me having heard the noise of horses at my door i fully suspected it was he who was paying me a call but i was so absorbed in my task that i lost my temper so far as to cry out at the moment he opened my door i am not at home the king without a word put on his cloak again and went away when i had laid down my pallet and recalled in cold blood what i had done i reproached myself so strongly that the same evening i went to the king of poland for the purpose of proffering my excuses and asking pardon what a reception you gave me this morning he said as soon as he set eyes on me he then immediately went on i quite understand how a very busy artist becomes impatient if disturbed and so you may believe that i am not at all angry with you he obliged me to remain to supper and there was no further mention of my delinquency 
i rarely miss the little suppers of the king of poland lord whitworth the english ambassador to russia and the marquis de riviere were likewise faithful attendants we all three preferred these intimate gatherings to the large mobs because after supper there was always a delightful round of chat enlivened especially by the king who knew a host of interesting anecdotes one evening when i had followed the usual invitation i was struck by the singular change i observed in our dear prince's appearance his left eye particularly looked so dull that i was frightened at leaving i said on the staircase to lord whitworth and to the marquis de riviere on whose arm i was do you know i am very anxious about the king why so they asked he seemed remarkably well he talked as he always does i have the misfortune to be a good soothsayer i replied i read uncommon trouble in his eyes the king will soon die alas i had only prophesied too well for the next day the king went down with an attack of apoplexy and a few days later was buried in the citadel close to catherine i did not learn of his death without feeling a very real sorrow which was shared by all who had known the king of poland i am rarely mistaken in the meaning of the ocular expression the last time i saw the duchess de mazarin who was in perfect health and in whom nobody observed the least change i said to my husband in another month the duchess will not be alive and my prophecy came true stanislas poniatowski never married he had a niece and two nephews his oldest nephew prince joseph poniatowski is well known through his military talents and the great bravery which have earned for him the name of the polish bayard when i knew him at st petersburg he might have been twenty-five to twenty-seven years old though his forehead was already devoid of hair his face was remarkably handsome all his features admirably regular were indicative of a noble soul he had exhibited such prodigious valor and so much military science in the late war against the turks that the public voice already proclaimed him a great captain and i was surprised upon seeing him how any one could win so high a reputation at that early age at st petersburg all vied with each other in welcoming and making much of him at a great supper given him to which i was bidden all the women urging him to have his portrait painted by me he answered with a modesty conspicuous in his character i must win several more battles before i can be painted by madame lebrun when i again saw joseph poniatowski at paris i at first did not recognize him so much was he changed into the bargain he was wearing a hideous wig that completed his metamorphosis his renown had however reached such a point that there was no need for him to be distressed at having lost his good looks he was then preparing to go to war in germany under napoleon to whom he as a pole had become a faithful ally the heroism he displayed in the campaign of eighteen twelve and eighteen thirteen is sufficiently known as well as the tragic occurrence that ended his noble career joseph poniatowski's brother resembled him in no way he was lanky chilly and dry i got a close view of him at st petersburg and remember that one morning he came to my house to look at countess stroganov's portrait and that he concerned himself about nothing but the frame he nevertheless manifested great pretensions as a picture fancier permitting his opinions to be guided by an artist who drew very well but whose chief distinction was to imitate raphael's sketches in consequence of which he harbored a sovereign disdain for the french school the king of poland's niece madame minichek showed herself obliging to me on many occasions and it was a great pleasure to meet her again in paris at st petersburg she made me do the likeness of her daughter then quite a child whom i painted playing with her dog as well as the portrait of her uncle the king of poland in a henry the fourth costume the first portrait i did of that charming prince i kept for myself one of the pleasantest reminiscences of my travels is that of my reception as a member of the academy of st petersburg 
Count Stroganov, then director of the fine arts, apprised me of the appointed day for my installation. I ordered a uniform of the academy in the shape of an Amazonian dress, a little violet bodice, a yellow skirt, and a black hat and feathers. At one o'clock I arrived in a room leading to a long gallery, at the end of which I perceived Count Stroganov at a table. I was requested to go up to him. For this purpose I was obliged to traverse the long gallery in question, where tiers of benches had been placed which were full of spectators. But as I luckily recognized a number of friends and acquaintances in the crowd, I reached the other end of the gallery without feeling too much confusion. The Count addressed me in a very flattering little speech, and then presented me on behalf of the Emperor with a diploma nominating me a member of the Academy. Everybody thereupon burst into such applause that I was moved to tears, and I shall never forget that touching moment. That evening I met several persons who had witnessed the affair. They mentioned my courage in passing through that gallery so full of people. You must suppose, I answered, that I had guessed from their faces how kindly they were prepared to greet me. Very soon after, I did my own portrait for the Academy of St. Petersburg. I represented myself painting, palette in hand. In dwelling on these agreeable memories of my life, I am trying to postpone the moment when I must speak of the sorrows, the cruel anxieties which disturbed the peace and happiness I was enjoying at St. Petersburg. But I must now enter upon the sad particulars. My daughter had attained the age of seventeen. She was charming in every respect. Her large blue eyes, sparkling with spirit, her slightly tip-tilted nose, her pretty mouth, magnificent teeth, a dazzling fresh complexion, all went to make up one of the sweetest faces to be seen. Her figure was not very tall. She was lithe, without, however, being lean. A natural dignity reigned in all her person, although she had as much vivacity of manner as of mind. Her memory was prodigious. Everything remained that she had learned in her lessons or in the course of her reading. She had a delightful voice, and sang exquisitely in Italian, for at Naples and St. Petersburg I had given her the best singing masters, as well as instructors of English and German. Moreover, she could accompany herself on the piano or the guitar. But what enraptured me above everything else was her happy disposition for painting, so that I cannot say how proud and satisfied I was over the many advantages she commanded. I saw in my daughter the happiness of my life, the future joy of my old age, and it was therefore not surprising that she gained an ascendancy over me. When my friend said, You love your daughter so madly that it is you who obey her, I would reply, Do you not see that she is loved by everyone? Indeed, the most prominent residents of St. Petersburg admired and sought her out. I was not invited without her, and the successes she won in society were far more to me than any of my own had ever been. Since I could but rarely leave my studio of a morning, I sometimes consented to confide my daughter to the Countess Zernichev in order that she might take part in sledging expeditions, which amused her greatly, and the Countess would sometimes also take her to spend the evening at her house. There she met a certain Nigris, Count Zernichev's secretary. This Monsieur Nigris had a fairly good face and figure. He might have been about thirty. As for his abilities, he drew a little and wrote a beautiful hand. His soft ways, his melancholy look, and even his yellowish paleness gave him an interesting and romantic air, which so far affected my daughter that she fell in love with him. Immediately the Zernichev family put their heads together and began an intrigue to make him my son-in-law. Being informed what was happening, my grief was deep, as may well be imagined. But unhappy as I was at the thought of giving my daughter, my only child, to a man without talents, without fortune, without a name, I made inquiries about this Monsieur Negris. Some spoke well of him, but others reported badly, 
so that the days went by without my being able to fix upon any decision in vain did i attempt to make my daughter understand how unlikely in every way this marriage was to make her happy her head was so far turned that she would take nothing from my affection and experience on the other hand people who had determined to get my consent employed all possible means to wring it from me i was told that m Negris would carry off my daughter and that they would marry at some country inn i had little faith in this elopement and secret marriage because m Negris had no fortune and the family that befriended him was not blessed with superfluous money i was threatened with the emperor and i answered then i will tell him that mothers have truer and older rights than all the emperors in the world it will scarcely be credited that the persons intriguing against me were so sure of making me yield under persecution that they were already throwing out allusions to a marriage portion as i was supposed to be very rich the ambassador from naples came to see me and asked a sum which far exceeded my possessions i had left france with eighty louis in my pocket and a portion of my savings i had since lost through the bank of venice i could have endured the malignant and stupid slanders which the cabal spread and which were repeated to me from all sides it pained me much more to see my daughter becoming alienated and withdrawing all her confidence from me her old governess madame Charot, who had already made the great mistake of allowing her to read novels without my knowledge had totally dominated her mind and embittered her against me to such a degree that all a mother's love was impotent to fight against her sinister influence at last my daughter who had become thin and changed fell ill altogether i was then of course obliged to surrender and wrote to m lebrun so that he might send his approval m lebrun had in recent letters spoken of his wish to marry our daughter to guerin whose successes in painting had been brooded loud enough to reach my ears but this plan which had such attractions for me now could not be carried out i informed m lebrun making him feel that having but this one dear child we must sacrifice everything to her desires and her happiness the letter gone i had the satisfaction of seeing my daughter recover but alas that satisfaction was the only one she gave me owing to the distance her father's answer was long delayed and some one convinced her that i had only written to m lebrun to prevent him from assenting to what she called her felicity the suspicion hurt me cruelly nevertheless i wrote again several times and after letting her read my letters gave them to her so that she might post them herself even this great condescension on my part was not enough to undeceive her with the distrust toward me that was incessantly being poured into her she said to me one day i post your letters but i am sure you write others to the contrary i was stunned and heartbroken when at that very moment the postman arrived with a letter from m lebrun giving his consent a mother might then without being accused of exaction have expected some excuses or thanks but in order to have it understood how entirely those wicked people had estranged my daughter's heart i will confess that the cruel child showed not the least gratitude at what i had done for her in immolating all my wishes hopes and dislikes the wedding was nevertheless enacted a few days later i gave my daughter a very fine wedding outfit and some jewelry including a bracelet mounted with some large diamonds on which was her father's likeness her marriage portion the product of the portraits i had painted at st petersburg i deposited with the banker livio the day after my daughter's wedding i went to see her i found her placid and unelated over her bliss being at her house again a fortnight later i made the inquiry you are very happy i trust now that you are married to him monsieur Negris, who was talking with someone else had his back turned to us and since he was afflicted with a severe cold had a heavy great coat on his shoulders she replied i confess that fur coat is disenchanting how could you expect me to be smitten with such a figure as that 
thus a fortnight had sufficed for love to evaporate as for me the whole charm of my life seemed to be irretrievably destroyed i even felt no joy in loving my daughter though god knows how much i still did love her in spite of all her wrongdoing only mothers will fully understand me soon after her marriage she took the smallpox although i had never had that frightful disease no one succeeded in preventing me from hastening to her side her face was so swelled up that i was seized with terror but it was only for her that i feared and as long as the illness lasted i thought not of myself for a single moment at last i was glad to see her restored without being marked in the least i then resolved to leave for moscow i wanted a change from st petersburg where i had been suffering to such a degree that my health was affected not that after the wedding the wretched stories which had been brought up against me left any impression on the contrary the people who had blackened my character most repented of their injustice however i was unable to shake off the memory of the past months i felt miserable but kept my trouble to myself i complained of no one i observed silence even with my dearest friends on the subject of my daughter and the man she had given me for a son going so far as reticence toward my brother to whom i had written frequently since being apprised by him of another misfortune indeed this period of my life was devoted to tears we had lost our mother hoping then to obtain relief from so much sorrow through distraction and a change of scene i hastened the life-sized portrait i was then doing of the empress maria as well as several half-length portraits and left for moscow on the fifteenth of october eighteen hundred end of chapter eleven recording by james k white chula vista